Hey, thanks you, thank you all for coming. This is a heck of a day, November 9th. <laughs> On this day in 1938, Kristallnacht began. <laughs> That's the only time Kristallnacht ever got a laugh. <laughs> On this day in 1989, the Berlin Wall came down. Did you know that? And on this day in 2016, Donald Trump was declared president-elect of the United oh, States. God, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. How, how many of you are still in the denial phase of grief? <laughs> how about the anger stage? Who's in the anger? <laughs> and the bargaining stage? Like, if you include Venezuelans in the travel ban, then the Muslims are OK, too? I'll just say to you guys that you were smart to do the book signing before the event. Now people can read along. So all rise and open to page 160 as <laughs> scripture says, when I mentioned to Mike Pence recently how good my golf scores have been, so incredibly good, better than ever, he said good playing, good comes from good praying. Did you write that? I think I did, yes. <laughs> So did you two know? That was before Judge Roy Moore made religion a whole new part of the Trump uh, era, uh, as he did today. You know? did, did you two know each other uh, a long time? Have you worked together before? No, not a long time. But I, I mean, I was aware of who he was. I knew him from when he founded Spy and uh, wrote Spy and his career beyond that. And um, uh, I was contacted. We have Emily in common. Is that how you got me to do the podcast? Emily Botine at Who got me to do the fill-in for you? I did. I don't know. He launched my podcast career because he asked me, yeah, he asked me foolishly to fill in for him on his podcast. And the rest is history. I just took off in the yeah. podcast world. You know. <laughs> I, I, I filled in, you know. And, uh, the, uh, but he, didn't know, he asked me to do his podcast, uh, Studio 360, and I did. I'm always a big fan of his. And uh, when the time came to do the book, and I, I realized I... A, didn't have the ability to write the book, and, and B, I didn't really have the time. I, he was the only person I could think of who was smart enough and funny enough to write this book, so. A round of applause. Thank you. And, and he says, and, and he has been the most generous of, of collaborators, and, and give me, gives me credit like this again and again and again. He, 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 he was an actual collaborator. There are many sentences uh, written by Alec Baldwin. <laughs> In this, uh, in this book, and, 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 and funny ones, good ones, great ones. I have a few, I have a few. So for example, and I don't know who wrote this line, but chapter eight is called, It Finally Felt Real Like a Movie. <laughs> Which, Kurt, could be a satire of Donald Trump's brain, but it also could be a satire of American culture. Uh, indeed, well, and that's the subject of my, of my previous book, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, all of those uh, chapter titles, uh, by the way, are, are from lines in the book, which our brilliant creative director, Bonnie Siegler, had the idea of plucking l phrases that we had in the text out and making them chapter titles, and they work great. But yes, indeed, I mean, Donald Trump is, is and, and the fact of the election of this reality show guy uh, as president of the United States is, is the, the fulfillment of, of where America has traveled these last uh, 50 years. And in that way that uh, uh, people who, who are voters, and I try to put myself in their position, uh, were exposed to him uh, for a, a significant period of time. You know, The Apprentice is a show, if you understand TV, obviously, and its impact on people, The Apprentice ran for many, many years. I'd forgotten that. You know, when the election comes and Trump is running, uh, and Trump is running uh, in the, in the, uh, for the primary, I thought, this guy's going to get his head handed to him and be just dispatched very quickly. You know, and then it goes on and on and becomes this uh, Freddy Krueger movie that we're living through. But, uh, <laughs> the, um, um, but, the, but the point is, is that, that uh, you know, I remember working in the issue of campaign finance reform and work, working with uh, uh, Josh Rosenkrantz when he was the director of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School and, and uh, 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 Bert Newborn, and they were educating this group. I worked with them about the history of campaign finance reform. And one guy just said, you know, the real admonition is we've got to get Americans to stop electing, uh, choosing uh, uh, presidential candidates like they choose laundry soap. This is, it's, it's advertisements, and they're all very glib, and they're all very shiny. And Trump is on TV year after year after year, positioned in this certain way, where people actually believed he was this crack executive, this can-do guy on this TV show. 
And that's what they voted for. And, and, and not only, uh, it's a great point, not only that he was there 15 years being sold to, to many millions of Americans, that show was a top 10 show for a while, um, the fact of it as a reality show, of, of this blurring, of, of, of creating this fiction of him hiring people, and oh, it's reality. Reality isn't the name of the, of the genre, yet it isn't reality at all, and, and that has served uh, Donald Trump in his compulsive uh, falsehood uh, purveying uh, very nicely. And so in chapter 24, called The Special Counsel is Totally Rigged, you write, <laughs> As we were discussing replacements for Comey, I was very strong on needing somebody who looked the part, a real central casting FBI director. Yeah. Well, and, and, and the, the, the Comey, we, 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 had, the, we had him ta thinking about uh, firing Comey, uh, and that was written weeks before <laughs> he fired Comey. Kurt, 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 I'm not just saying this, I mean, beyond his writing ability, I think he's like in some weird, I don't know what, what culture I can ascribe this to, must be in his DNA, his family, because he like predicted many, many things that are in the book. He writes stuff in the book and send me the, uh, the chapters, and sure enough, three, four weeks later, there it is in the paper, what Kurt wrote for the book. And then he said, don't, don't write a chapter about nuclear war, because yeah, it don't will come that. true. <laughs> yeah. um, Do you think that image thing, that central casting thing, is why he's so obsessed with generals, because they look like his idea of authoritative? Don't know. I, 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 no, I think that's absolutely true, and, and it's, it's no joke about, you know, why he nominated Rex Tillerson rather than Bob Corker, and we make jokes about it for Secretary of State, was because he was a big guy with good hair. I literally think that, I mean, it was reported as much that that's true. So it is this central casting <coughs> idea that it's all a show um, is, is really part of his understanding of the presidency. I mean, th th what was reported while he was running that, <laughs> that uh, his son, Donald Jr., uh, told John Kasich's uh, aides when, when they were talking to him about uh, being vice president, and the, and the aide to Kasich said, well, what, what, oh, the, Donald Trump Jr. said to the aide, like, oh, no, he can handle domestic and foreign policy. And the guy asked back, well, what will the president do? Oh, he'll just be president. Yeah. And I think that's his understanding. Well, we had a joke once. I said that there's a, an image I have of a, of a Bannon uh, has a house I, I don't know his personal details, but Bannon, let's say, has a house or an apartment in uh, Georgetown or somewhere adjacent to the district, and uh, he's, he's got like a leather uh, card room, and there's a card table, and they're, they're playing poker, and there's whiskey and cigars. I mean, but rather than playing poker and turning over cards, they're all going around the table holding up the names of nominees for different positions. <laughs> and, and the goal of these meetings was literally to hear the editorial board of the New York Times screaming and crying all the way down 90, uh, 95, Highway, uh, uh, Interstate High 95, and they're, they're like one guy turns over Pruitt for EPA, and they're all like, ooh, good one, ooh, good one, you know? The, the idea that I think that, uh, in my opinion, we'll, we'll never know, and, and, the, and these are horribly, I admit that these are horribly unkind things to say. I don't think Trump had one single iota of input into who was in his cabinet at all. He's surrounded by handlers, they do everything. I think he embraces, as you mentioned, military culture because it's, it's, it's the stuff he thinks he understands. I can sit down with some people and they're gonna say, they're gonna say Yemeni is bad. Yemeni is bad. Remember this, Mr. President, Yemeni is bad. <laughs> And, he'll, and I'm, I'm, I, don't want, I don't mean to say, just segue into this, but of course he's there going, Yemeni's yeah, bad, <laughs> bad. You know, he's just, it's all distilled into something very simple for him. And the, I think the military thing is in some ways, I think, he, I think he thinks it's the least complicated of all of it. Right, and they're really in charge. They yeah. can do what they the want. The generals are never gonna lie. They're gonna tell me who's up, who's down, good guy, bad guy. When DeVos comes in, and you know, when they're like, eh, Secretary DeVos here to talk about education, tell her I'm not in. I'm not in, <laughs> you know, he doesn't want to go there. You, you remind me of something. Um, you know, I've never had Trump, we've never invited Trump, except during the campaign, as a guest on the show. You never did? Because it never occurred to us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the only time that I covered him was when I was just starting out in New York radio. I was a street reporter for a local radio station, and I was sent one day to cover Donald Trump introducing quarterback Doug Flutie with the football team that Trump owned for a USFL. while. USFL. And you just- The generals. Well, that's the punchline. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
I stepped you on two, it. You two, you <laughs> two. How, how did you work together on it? Was it more like the writer's room on 30 Rock or Dick Van Dyke with Buddy and Sally? Tina Fey well, was there writing, really. Tina Fey. Way. With Tina Fey, I would hand some pages to Tina, and she'd take the subway out to his house. Um, um, we, we, we met a lot, we, we spent a lot of time, even though t time was of the essence and we didn't have much time to do it, uh, sitting down and just talking it through. How would this, we need a story, how would this work, and, and well, here's an idea, and, and, and getting that down, and then, uh, and then we started to write. But I think that, and I, I really think this is, uh, this is obvious, you know, everybody would assume this, and that is he's a writer and I'm an actor. And so when I worked with him, I, I, I thought everybody's going to know he's going to do the writing, and, and he knows everyone thinks he's going to do the writing. So I'm not going to get too heavy-handed and say, there were like three things where I'd say, well, I really think this is a good thing we should have it in the book. And he'd be like, okay, you know, he would, he would acquiesce, but not a lot, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was like, well, because it's his name and everybody assumes it's his material. And uh, we met a few times, we met several times to get that going. Then I think we were at like the Marlton Hotel and I basically said, good luck, Kurt. Yes. And I left. Yes. And, uh, and, and you, but you tell them, because my recollection, and it's not that long ago, but my mind is, is going uh, uh, lately. Um, it, this came, the, the material came through you and the writing happened very fast. It, well, we didn't have much time, so right. it had to happen fast. But I, no, I, I take years to write books ordinarily, a couple of years anyway. And uh, A, I'd been paying attention to Donald Trump for a long time. And, and B, the, 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 here was a fictional character already created. I didn't have to make him up. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and, and uh, um, so I also, and then I went through several weeks of just uh, immersing myself in especially the long unedited transcripts in the New York Times and the Washington Post with his language and any, any unedited, just pure Trump, because to learn the language, it was like literally becoming fluent in Trumpese, and I made myself a little lexicon saying, here's the, ad here's the negative adverbs, here's the positive adverbs, here's the negative adjectives, and so I had my little, my little uh, you know, English Trump uh, phrase, phrase book that I could use as I was writing, and, and as Alex says, yeah, I, I wrote, uh, you know, I had a draft of the first half in, uh, I guess a month and a half or so, and he and gave it to him, and he had lots and lots and lots and lots of suggestions, many of which he entertainingly gave me over the phone in the voice, which <laughs> made it fun. And um, 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 then then we went on and did the rest, and uh, and the, yeah, there was real back and forth, and there was real, you know, there was there was a good creative some tension. conflict. Do you think yeah. there was? Well, well there not was conflict. Right, you, 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 I, I work in movies and TV. You don't know what creative conflict is, my yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. no, but, but also, no, he was a pushover. What, what can I say? I think I was. I think I was. But, but, but interestingly enough, did you sense in your uh, observation of Trump, I mean, it's weird how in New York, uh, you, know, you know, he's this image on the reality show and on the TV show for many years. And I wonder if you share how I felt where in New York he was like a cipher, you know. You never really saw him or got to know him. I have been raising money for charitable organizations in New York and on Long Island where I live for almost 30 years now. And I'm, you know, tickets and tables and going to this and going to that, all for a cause. I mean, uh, some of it more for the arts, but some of it to raise money. And, and if he popped in with his wife, they'd have the tux, the gown, uh, red carpet, shoot, 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 gone. He was never a table mate. You never had a chance to interact with him. Did you find that that's the truth? Well, experience? even the real estate community says he's not really part of us, you know, the other big real estate moguls at his level, they're like, no, 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 no. He's not, he doesn't do anything with, uh, with the group, he doesn't work with us. Hang out. So, but, but you did, um, besides the book, you did the video that played before, that was in front of Trump Tower, wasn't it? Uh, it? We did some, we, we did a bunch, there's some, there's, there's, by the way, hilarious and wonderful and very expensively produced photographs in the book, many of them. That's why the book is so heavy, by the way. It <coughs> but it is, it's literally true, stuff. and it's why we spent, we spent two days as if on making a movie, essentially shooting all these pictures, including uh, in front of Trump Tower, which was, uh, we had no permission or permits or, <laughs> we, truly, we just showed up in, a, in, a, in an SUV with him in drag. Um, <laughs> I mean, dressed as Trump is what I mean, but, you know. Remember years ago when I made, we made films, we were doing a film in New York in the 90s or something many years ago. I was very uh, new to that part of the business. 
the late 80s, and they said, uh, and one person turned to the other, the director, to the producer, or the location manager, and they said, uh, and I'm standing uh, by the side, and they said, we're gonna have to shoot this scene Morrissey style. We're gonna have to go Morrissey style. And I lean, and I go, well, what's that? What, what, what did you say? And they said, uh, Morrissey style, like Paul Morrissey. He would go in one day, and he'd look at the lobby of a building, or an office building in Manhattan, and he'd case the joint, and he'd leave, and he'd come back the next day, and they had the shots worked on a piece of paper, and they'd run in with no permits and just start shooting in the lobby of the building. <laughs> until they got kicked out. They tried to squeak. They had the most important shots first and worked their way down. And, uh, the, uh, and we kind of had the same Morrison yes. approach to Trump Tower. No, and then... And then go ahead and shoot us. As soon know. as they didn't shoot us, and as soon as the CIA, or the, rather the Secret Service, didn't like, take him down, yeah. uh, you got comfortable, and he was, you were out there in Trump, dressed as Trump, stopping traffic on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> um, um, uh, I could shoot people here, and no one would arrest me. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, um, it was, it, and, and once that went well, it was, it was a the rest of the photographs were a breeze, but that was, that was a nice Mark thing. Seliger, the great Mark Seliger, who did a, a famous, famous photographer, you might, many of you might know him, where he shoots for Vanity Fair and all high-end, high-end fashion, and uh, I mean, a great, great guy, an old friend of mine, I shot a lot of magazine work with Mark, and he very graciously agreed to do this with us, and we had two pretty intense days heading out to uh, uh, New Jersey and here in the city and out in Brooklyn. He has a great crew and a great group of people. And we got some fun pictures. And he's a guy who had shot Donald Trump multiple times in the past, so he knew, he knew how to do the real thing um, as well. Alec, how does the writing work with your Trump scenes on Saturday Night Live? When, when in the week do you personally get involved? Well, they will call me, I mean, naturally, you know the show's coming, and a Monday comes and that host is coming into town, and. Monday is a meeting uh, that they have about, you know, what the person's comfortable with. They want to, uh, and they want to, I think the writers want to meet the host to kind of suss out how game they are, uh, how nervous they are to do live TV. And there are many, many people who are on a wish list who just won't do SNL because they don't think they can handle the live component. So during that week, of course, with Trump, you wake up on Monday and, you know, six things have already happened over the weekend <laughs> that may be uh, material for the show. So then the week goes on, and, and, and literally the, the staff of SNL, as you can imagine, their whole attitude about, this, about the sketch is always like, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> you know, and then the, the thing comes on Thursday or whatever, and they write that sketch. And um, uh, so I go and... Uh, you know, I let the writers do the writing in, in most aspects of my life. When I did 30 Rock, I was the beneficiary of uh, great writing, and uh, when, I did, uh, when I do SNL, I'm the beneficiary. And when I write a, when I write a book, I'm the beneficiary of great writing. <laughs> but he, he wrote, I must say, a, a very beautifully written and revelatory autobiography that came out early this year that was, uh, I don't think you had anybody write it. I think my wife had just had our third child in three years. So I had a lot of time on my hands to sit home and, you know, focus and... Yeah, there is a section in the book that I couldn't help but notice that says, best thing about the summer was no SNL, which is a show that I made successful after it was completely failing and <laughs> should have been canceled 25 years ago, but wasn't. You get the idea. Can, can I read passage, that part, passage please? written mm. by Alec Baldwin. I wrote this passage. I'm going to throw myself under the bus here. He says, best thing about the summer was no SNL, which is a show that I made successful after it was completely failing and should have been canceled 25 years ago, but wasn't, because Lorne Michaels, who's a Canadian immigrant, maybe legal, maybe not. <laughs> so ungrateful, must have terrible dirt on the executives at RCA and General Electric and Comcast. And I have a great sense of humor, but the hater Alec phone message Baldwin is so bad at playing me like he's Aldo Ray or somebody. He and his brothers were like the Bowery Boys of Long Island. Th this is my favorite line that, that I wrote, as he, as he says. Remember, he goes, he goes, famous losers, all big mouths and no balls, although the young one, Stephen, is good people. <laughs> he, says, he says, before he went born again, I'm told he was like the David Bowie of Massapequa, great A perverts. Oh, that, that's true of many of the born-agains before they become born-again. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Our brother Steve, the David yes. Bowie and, of Massapequa. And, and, and what Alec, Alec escaped was the conversation that I had to have with the Penguin publishing lawyer about whether Stephen Baldwin might mm -hmm. take mm -hmm. action against but, us. No, yeah. uh, for, for, I said, 
his brother said it. I mean, what are you getting? So I was able to convince them that we could, yeah. we wouldn't be sued. I hope that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Do 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 you want to continue the conversation with Melania that you started through me the other day? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, if I told you who that, I mean, I really don't want to say, I'm going to whisper it to you. I think I told you, didn't I, off camera? Off you mind. said it on the air. Who the person was. Oh, you didn't say right. that on the air. <clears throat> you want to give them the background? Let me just tell you, it's a secret between just us in this room. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> but yeah, I'm doing, a, a, we're at the Emmys, and uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I ran into somebody, um, and they said to me, God, you know, uh, uh, or no, we're not the Emmys, or I forget where we were, and someone said to me, well, you know, I, I spoke to so-and-so, who spoke to so-and-so, who's in the administration, or was in the administration, and said, he told me that Melania loves your Trump. I mean, she watches <laughs> SNL all the time, and thinks it's the funniest thing in the world, and, and he hates the fact that she thinks you're funny, <laughs> and he despises you even more because yeah. she thinks you're funny. And I'm, I'm telling you, this guy told me that somebody very high up in the administration, or formerly high up in the administration. <laughs> 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 That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. <laughs> That's why I'm safe. <coughs> That's why the secret is safe. But anyway, the, um, I said that on your show, that Melania is, um, how could she not be? <laughs> how many of but you then, feel, how many just applaud if you feel like there's more to Melania than you see? I think there might be more to Melania. Right. Than you see. That's tepid applause. You notice the tepid applause. The, um, but did you see the reply? It was the first time my show ever got covered on SarahPalin.com. <laughs> Twitchy. <laughs> this yeah. is true. And so Melania had some kind of full-throated denial. No, the White House denied. Yeah. yeah. Well, their staff did. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, Trump's on the phone <coughs> telling her social secretary what to say to yeah. the press yeah. while Melania's in the other room watching SNL on the internet. <laughs> Does it, change, does it change the writing or anything about the process on Saturday Night Live knowing that the president might actually be watching and actually take things seriously? Last year that was true. Last year, during the election year, immediately after um, uh, Trump's responses to what we did, we would all just look at each other. We couldn't believe we were in the middle of that kind of uh, event. Uh, we're going on TV and making fun of the president, and the president is not only pissed off He's like taking us on on Twitter, you know, whoever thought that would happen. Um, which is unthinkable to us. But, uh, you know, I for one am somebody who, <coughs> not to just jerk this to something more serious, but I for one was somebody who, I totally believed that Trump, when he won, he would change. I thought he would, I mean, I had all the faith in the world that he would change. Because I says, as I said to someone, not only does the president, is their position, this rarefied position in terms of power and um, uh, you know, the, the, the influence you have on people. You're the most famous person in the world. You're the most uh, covered person in the world and so forth. You're also a, a man or a woman when the time comes who has a vista into the world that no other person can ever have. You meet the smartest of the smart. They come to you, you come to them, you fly around the world, they come to the White House. You're just immersed and the brightest and the most caring and the most compassion and the most creative the president gets to really, really, really sit and, 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 and dine among and spend time among uh, the, 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 the creme de la creme of our society and the world. And I thought, how could that not change somebody? How could that not change someone? And much to my surprise, um, <laughs> here we are. Um, how many of you uh, remember the 80s? I, I, I didn't say we're alive in the 80s, I said remember the 80s. How many of you read Spy Magazine? <laughs> so, draw a connection between then and now, because you were writing a lot about Donald Trump and watching Donald Trump a lot yeah. in the 1980s. Yeah. What was he like then? What drew you to him as a subject for Spy at that time? Well, we started Spy in the end of 1986, when he was still not that well known even in New York, and but we immediately saw in him, in his bullying and in his lying and in his calling up page six every day to be in the paper and his voracious need for attention and all the things he still is that we saw in sort of embryonic form as just a great character for a startup magazine of satirical journalism and thought, this guy, this guy's for us. And uh, we did a, uh, and so, and, and, and so, we, we covered him, and then and, 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 uh, 
of course, according to the phrase that st has stuck with him ever since, short-fingered Bulgarian. Um, that was you? We invented the short-fingered meme before we called things memes. And, uh, but, but, uh, and, and, and we covered him journal. We talked about his, his bankruptcy. When it was happening, we, 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 it, was, it was tough coverage as well as juvenile ridicule. And, uh, but um, uh, he, my view is, I mean, and, and at one point, we took a poll, national poll of, uh, in 1988 saying, who are you disappointed, America? Uh, an actual poll. Um, uh, that it, who isn't running for president. And, and the fact that 4% of Americans say they were disappointed that Donald Trump wasn't running. We made a big deal out of, oh, Trump should run, and we thought it was a funny joke. And it was a funny joke because it was so ridiculous that such a person uh, could, could be elected president in 1988 and 1992, and, but here we are. So my view is he's the same guy, and, and what always struck me at the time was I had never seen anyone, I've never been aware of anyone whose need for attention, media attention, is more voracious, more like an addict's than his. And, uh, and I think that's why he didn't change. I, I think that's why he didn't pivot. I, I mean, he, he, people, we, we pay attention to him, the world pays attention to him when he does nutty things, inappropriate things, outrageous things. If he were just being a regular president, He'd just be a regular president, and he wouldn't be getting as much attention. Was he as, as angry and as racially aggressive in those days? Uh, no. I, not, I mean, again, I didn't see it. I mean, except when the, 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 the five young black men were arrested for the rape in Central Park that they didn't commit and were later exonerated for, and he took out ads in the paper saying they should be executed even before they were tried. Um, there was that. And then he didn't... Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's a thing. But, but, but then no, he, he wasn't as the, angry. He, he wasn't didn't accept the exoneration. No, well, no, just as he didn't really accept until 10 days before last fall's election that uh, uh, Barack Obama uh, was born in the United States. Um, uh, he, doesn't, he, he never admits he's wrong, even when he is, in that case, desperately wrong. But no, I, he, he, he didn't seem like an angry guy or, frankly, as unhappy a guy. Alec talks about how he, he, you play him by thinking of him as unhappy. As miserable as I could possibly make him. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't think he used to be that much. I, I think that is the change in him, actually. Um, about the tone of this book, do you have any concern that having this kind of fun even though it's at Trump's expense, distracts from how profoundly dangerous he actually might be, Alan? Well, I think people have asked me all the time about doing the TV show and uh, does, has that uh, kind of taken the edge off of our concerns about what, what to do? And, and that is that, uh, you know, the, the, I, I think, you know, this is a much longer conversation, which I don't want to bore everybody with now, but. You know, one component of it is is that uh, I mean, one candidate got the majority of the votes, and the other candidate won the electoral college, and the difference was significant in terms of popular vote. But nonetheless, he had the votes of tens of millions of people. Tens of millions of people bought that Trump image, that laundry soap salesmanship. And you know, when you when you read uh, my favorite article among many, or, or among my favorite articles rather, was Larissa McFarquhar wrote in the New Yorker. This, she goes down to West Virginia, takes a trip down to, to survey Trump voters. And a guy, I think it was, uh, I always forget his name, who was, I think, uh, taught uh, political science or something, or history at uh, a community college down there. All of his CV, I'm forgetting. But uh, he basically said, you know, a lot of times you're from this area, you leave this area, you go to New York, and you get the same treatment all the time. You know, are, are those your real teeth in your head? And do you own any shoes? And do you sleep with your sister? And they've got this, you know, New Yorkers and liberal elites have this very condescending view of this part of the world. And he said, he goes, a lot of the people in this area don't necessarily support Trump or any of his opinions, but we know how much you hate him, and this is our chance to give the middle finger to the rest of the world, the rest of the country. And I thought, there it is, there it is. People who, you know, they're, they, they're, they're, hate is a great motivator. You know, to me, the most, the most mesmerizing, we may have said this on the air, the most, uh, the most kind of unsettling thing was how people channel this hatred for Hillary Clinton. Now, in my lifetime, you know, there are, there are people who have deserved, candidates who have deserved a, a certain kind of scrutiny and have stirred up a kind of a, 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 a negative reaction. George Wallace is an obvious example. But I never felt that Hillary Clinton qualified to become among the most hated people in American political life. And somehow they succeeded in doing that. 
and, and the thing I'll say about the comedy, oh, is it, should we be being funny in, about uh, Donald Trump? I, I, what I'm, one thing I'm very happy about this book and that our editors allowed it and Alec was down with it and we, the, is where, we, where this book goes in the end. It only came out two days ago, so very few people have read it. But it goes to a pretty dark, uh, not so, uh, you know, tousling his hair or just saying he's orange way. And, and, and it, it's a, you know, it's, it's pretty, a pretty grim. It's a pretty grim uh, in the end. Uh, but it's a lot of fun but, as well uh, as you but, get there. But hysterically grim. It's a grim. How, mu how much do you do political comedy, Alec, uh, to have an impact? And how much for entertainment purposes? Well, I, when they came to do, I mean, I think that the genesis of this is, is interesting. I've said this before, but when they came to me to do this, I told Lauren, I said, hell no. I said, I have no desire to be Trump. Most of the things you do, I mean, I'm not a mimic or an, or an impressionist, but to the extent I've been called upon to do some of that, in that S, typically in that SNL world and on 30 Rock, it's people that I have some degree of admiration for. Much easier to imitate somebody you admire because uh, ultimately you're getting towards something that you appreciate. It's about appreciation. So when the Trump thing came up, I said, under no circumstances am I going to come on Saturday Night Live and play Trump. And I was supposed to go do a film. And I was all set to do this movie, and the people who were doing the movie were supposed to put a certain percentage of my income in, a, in an escrow account. Because when you work for the major studios and networks, they may torture you over what number's on your check. But once you agree what that number is, the check is, never bounces. They've got tons of money, and they, the money is there. Indies, it's a different, it's, it's like uh, Pirates of the Caribbean when you're negotiating your contract. And uh, so you go into all these torturous negotiations about escrow. So I'm going week one, week two, I'm gonna go do the movie, I'm gonna go do the movie, and the money doesn't go into the bank, and I call, my friend is the producer, he's a friend of mine, and I go, I, I gotta tell you, we're not doing the movie. He said, the money's gonna be there Monday. Monday comes, no money. Friday comes the following week, another grace period, no money. I said, I call up Lauren, I go, I'm Trump. <laughs> I'm in. I hang up the phone, we walk away from the movie because it's not put together, which was a very difficult thing to do. And I go and do this, and again, I've said this many times, when this guy, Chris Kelly, um, uh, there's two Chris Kellys, one who wrote the Trump sketches, and the Chris Kelly, who's the stage manager, when he leads you by the hand to go to the stage, around the perimeter of the stage, so that the audience, the live audience, doesn't see you, and they have you behind a blind for you to step out for the introduction. Um, as I'm walking out to do the very first show, uh, the season premiere, Chris is taking me, and we're about to do the show, and I said, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, I watched hours of him on tapes, and him on YouTube, and so forth, and I'm like, you know, left uh, eyebrow up, stick your mouth out as far as you can, <laughs> get the hands going, the hands, the hands. And I'm, I'm going, but, but, but there are people who are far better. I mean, Daryl Hammond is a, is a great impressionist, and. Uh, they had Taryn Killiam doing it before. And there's a lot of people who do this better than I do, but um, I think uh, I, w I went and did it really not thinking very much about what the impact would be. I didn't think it would have very much impact because I thought he was going to lose. I thought we'd all have a little bit of a laugh and Hillary Clinton would be the president and we'd all you know, live happily ever after. So when it didn't happen that way and we kept going, people would come up to me. I have never had a reaction in my life of anything I've ever done people walk up to me. I mean, I'll be on the phone or I'll be with my kid. And I've had thousands of moments on the streets of New York of people walking by me going. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm eating. And they're like, through the window, they're like. <laughs> and they're very grateful <clears throat> that I'm doing this. And I go, oh, I'm like, that's cool. Oh, you're welcome. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> and, um, but I don't really think of the impact but that is the impact, I think, of good satire. It, it, yes, of course, it's preaching to the converted, it's preaching to the choir, but in a way that the choir needs, and the, in the way that it makes the choir feel good, yeah. you know? And also the fact that, that, as we're learning, that, you know, what's happening in this election, did, did the Russians hand the election to Donald Trump? I don't know. Did they make some contribution? They made some, con the, the Russians may have, and I'd love to get your opinion about this and yours. Did the Russians make some contribution? Perhaps. Did Hillary Clinton run a rather anemic campaign? Yes, I believe she did. We didn't get the best Hillary on the, uh, on the road here, and the, you know, they omitted certain states that they shouldn't have. And, and number three, uh, the Democratic Party uh, did not really function as well as it might have. I'm going to speak at the uh, fundraiser, the Jefferson Jackson dinner, 
in Iowa on November 27th to basically exhort them to say, you know, we can never allow this to happen again. And because you're running for president. I mean, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> I wish. You know, ab about preaching to the converted, Kurt, I've noticed that some columnists and commentators have actually said, and I can't think of any names right at this moment, but I know I've seen it, and prominent people saying, I used to think of my job as to convince people of my point of view. At this moment, with what's going on, I feel like my primary job is to bear witness. Right. Well, well one of the, 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 the people I find to be kind of heroic, or, or, or at least ones that I embrace, are the, cons the never Trump conservatives. Because unlike us, they're actually taking a risk. They, are be they have been banished from the right as, as thinkers, as intellectuals, as columnists, and whatever. So, so I find those people, I, I, I am reading those people uh, more intently. And, and uh, as much as you know, hell as, as the times took for hiring Brett Stevens, uh, for various reasons, and you know he's a, he's a true conservative. Uh, reading a guy like that explain why Trump is a disaster, I think, is important and will be important to 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 collect to collect into the reality-based community as many people on the right as possible. You know, you can't turn away from the news for two hours anymore without missing something. Um, and I don't know how many of you saw already today that Senator Bob Corker, who's one of those anti-Trump conservatives announced that he's actually going to hold hearings on the authority of the President of the United States to press the nuclear button. And... Did you and ever dream, are, did you ever dream we'd be living like this? No. And of course, you know, we don't want to give up civilian control of the military, but I, my guess is on first impression, he's going to use it as a vehicle to flesh out the thing that he has said publicly, that he questions the stability and the competence of the President of the United States. Well, it, it, see, it sounds a little bit like the preface to the 25th Amendment. We won't right. go straight to the 25th Amendment and say he's unfit, but let's, let's get specific about the thing that scares everybody the most. Is he fit to control our, our 4,000 nuclear weapons? I went to the Robert Kennedy uh, uh, Human Rights Center dinner right after the election, so we're there. And I'm, and I'm in a room, and it was one of the biggest events they had. So we're at the Hilton with like, you know, 800 people are there. And, and my friends in that family and beyond, Ethel's there, and Carrie, and all of my, and, and Bobby. And uh, they're there to raise money for the foundation. And, um, and uh, the recipient of one of the awards they gave that evening was Biden. And Biden gets up there. We're just a couple of weeks after the election. And, and everyone in a room full of Kennedy Democrats, by and large, is just numb with, with existential anxiety. And, uh, and they're showing all this imagery of Robert Kennedy. And today, I, uh, they're having the dinner again this year. And today, I contributed some readings to the program that's coming up. And you're reading and you're watching these clips of Robert Kennedy, and I don't need to get into that. But Biden said something that stayed with me. It just really, just, just really, really helped me. Uh, uh, right on the heels of the election, he said, people think this is bad. They think this is a bad situation. And it is bad. It, it's, it's devastating for us to have this uh, foisted upon us. He said, but he said, this isn't the worst we've lived through. And he's looking at the images of Kennedy over our shoulder. He goes, it's 1968. He goes, that was a bad year, 1968. King is killed. Kennedy is killed. The Democratic Convention. Nixon pulls the stake out of his heart, gets out of the coffin, and becomes the president of the United States. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's 1968. We, and Biden says, we survived that. And we will survive this. We will survive the fact that this guy, who's like some character out of Manchurian Candidate. He's like Angela Lansbury's husband in the Manchurian Candidate, this fop who becomes president. And, uh, uh, but we will survive this as well. So to expand on that, Kurt, your own solo book these days is Fantasy Land, How America Went Haywire, a 500-year history, <laughs> being made into a TV documentary series, I understand. If, if the gods of show business allow that, yes. And you have this sort of equation that America's unique religiosity plus 1960s relativism equals conditions for the election of Donald Trump. Is that oversimplifying it too much? Oh, no, not at all. That's, that's really, <laughs> why did I write 400 pages? No, it's, uh, it's certainly the religiosity plus the, the, the sort of self-selecting for suckers that this country uh, has uh, always provided. We want to believe, we want to believe, and, and often to believe the untrue. 
Uh, show business plays a big part of my argument of various kinds, and, and it's blurring of the, of the lines between reality and fantasy, and, and certain things about the 1960s where the gatekeepers and the establishments were blown apart, and, and your truth was your truth, and my truth was my truth, and whatever, man. Uh, which, which, weirdly and ironically, redounded in a, 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 a time when we've elected a president who, who says untrue things Every day, and I think it's interesting. I mean, this is just my. I'm not a historian. I'm not a writer like Kurt. This is as geeky as we get. I'll promise. Right. No. No. I mean, um, but the. But the. Um, you know, I've been watching uh, the Ken Burns Vietnam documentary, and I've become kind of obsessed with it. It's very. I don't know how many people have watched the Ken Burns. Applaud if you see it. All right. So this is. It's. This, it's so unsettling because you really are there, and there's so much footage of, of maneuvers and shooting and, and guns going off and helicopters just sustained minutes at a time. It's, it's, it's so uh, depleting to watch this sometimes, but you stay with it. And there are a lot of North Vietnamese uh, 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 military leaders and political leaders giving their point of view. But what I believe is that, is that the, and I, 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 I know I'm not the only one, uh, obviously, who has posited this, and that is that you know, we live in a world now where, uh, where we, we need to keep not apologizing for Vietnam. And to me, Trump is the next extension of that, of a, of a, as you say, uh, you talk about the religiosity. This is part of their religion. The United States never apologizes. You know, the United States is a country that is, uh, you know, the yin and the yang, uh, the most beautiful and the greatest and the loftiest ideas and, 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 and heroism, and a lot of blood on our hands for a lot of innocent people. We've killed this country because we've assigned that role of foreign policy. We just have consigned it to other people. We don't want to watch the coffins coming off the plane anymore, blah, 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 blah. And if we have uh, bone spurs, we don't want to fight that war. Right, exactly. Right. We have bone spurs. We need to send somebody else to fight that war. It, but, but, but I think that this, uh, this idea that, that uh, the, um, uh, you, know, you know, Trump is the next extension of that, of, of, of a privileged, white, exceptionalistic America that just does not want to look back and, and sort out their, their feelings about their real mistakes. And I think mainstream Republicanism has been setting up the country for Donald Trump for years and years and years. Right now, everybody looks at Mitt Romney as Mr. Moderate. Do you know what the book was called that he released to campaign on in 2012? No apology. Right. There you go. No, but, and that's, and that, that again, in the end of, at the end of fantasy, when I talk about how the Republican Party and the right had gone off the rails, Trump uh, used what what had been done by the the Republican elite, the the establishment Republicans for many years of 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 enabling and and keeping going these conspiracy theories about the UN is about to invade and and all the, you know they are they they have they had they set the they softened the ground for uh, uh, Trumpism in ways that they cannot escape once this administration is. Is, is what is seen as the catastrophe that it has been. And I just wonder if, I mean, and this is a fanciful idea, but I wonder if Trump will ultimately uh, push some quotient, some critical mass of people over from what I used to call, the, what everybody used to call the Rockefeller Republican category in, into becoming conservative Democrats, at least in terms of how they vote in the polls. Because you know, I've had friends my whole life who were like, hey man, I'm a Republican, I'm a country club Republican, I want low taxes, I want all these bothersome regulations off my back. I had a friend of mine once, her father was the president, he was a much older man, and we would have dinner out on Long Island. And I'll never forget, uh, after the crash in 2008, he looked at me, and if you saw the pain in this guy's eyes, he was the president and CEO of one of the biggest brokerage firms in Manhattan. And he looked at me, and he was this really great, he was like a New Yorker cartoon of a Republican. And he sat there, and he looked at me, he goes, Alec, I just want to say that when I ran the company, when the company didn't make money, he said, when the company made money, we made money. And when the company didn't make money, we didn't make money. And the idea now that they've all just, you know, kind of rigged that whole game where they make money no, no matter what. And I'm wondering if that crowd, who really don't give a damn about abortion, or, you know, they don't have any opinion about social issues, is going to turn around and go, this ain't my party anymore. It really has been taken over wall to wall by this nutbag, alt-right crowd. When but I say I... nutbag, alt-right crowd, what I mean is, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to get on social media and, like, you know, Although hurt me. At a time of the decline of the middle class, I don't know how many of those people there are. There still are some. Uh, you know, there are there, and, and I and I and my Lock. view politically is that we have to 
keep the doors open, as I said before, as much as possible to, to allow them to, to, to have redemption. Come and I have mean, a I, drink with us. I, well, I, I, my parents were conservative Republicans of a kind that, you know, there are many fewer of today, but if they were alive, they would find the, the, this guy uh, unacceptable. And, and, uh, and my mother, late in life actually before Trump, stopped being a Republican. So uh, I, I think there are some, and, I, and, and, and my view is that there's a chance, and you saw it in the elections the other night. I mean, like, okay, you know, you know, come on, come on. Maybe it takes you longer. Maybe it'll take you two and a half. Maybe it'll take you three and a half years to understand that this guy is a, a dangerous freak. But come on, you'll, you'll get there. And I think that's sort of the attitude I have. Where'd you grow up, Kurt? Nebraska. So there would probably be a lot of people there who fit into the category that Alec was talking about before, that we really think Trump is pretty grotesque. Kurt is one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, think Trump birth. is pretty grotesque, but the way the liberal elites, academia, journalism, everything look down on us. Oh, for sure. And no, and I think, I think those, I mean, to Alex's point about Larissa McFarquhar's piece in the people in West Virginia, I think it always struck uh, pundits as, why odd, why are these, why are these people, what, what do they feel about, what, what is this connection they feel with Donald Trump? What the connection they feel is exactly, is that New York, and, and he, he's never been able to really crack the elite in New York. Right. Uh, and, and he was always this outer borough guy who, who never really made the cut. And, and, and that's a real resentment and contempt. And, and, and they, they sensed that, I think, mm -hmm. and, and, and responded to it. Mm -hmm. So they, they hate now, us. They, they hate liberal elites as much as he does. Yeah. That's what they have in common. Now come the real questions. What do you think, oh, do you think that Jack from 30 Rock would have voted for Donald Trump? <laughs> well, I think I could safely say he definitely would not have voted for Hillary Clinton, so I don't know. <laughs> the, but the, uh, um, uh, he, he probably, uh, uh, he, he probably did vote for Trump, really holding his nose the whole time, the whole time. What do you think would be the first thing Trump would say if you were stuck in an elevator together. <laughs> Trump would say I'm sure that was for you, Kurt. Uh, uh, my hands are very, very big, my fingers, <laughs> I don't know. Um, because he does write that letter to my partner, Greg Carter, every couple of years, really pathetically insisting that his hands are actually large and his fingers are actually large, still. How would he say to me if yes. we were in the elevator? Yes. In the elevator? Yes. I don't know what he'd say. Have you ever had the steak tartare at 21? It's fantastic. <laughs> Are you a vegetarian, Alec? Okay, I should have known that. Alec, I hear you have a theory on Trump leaving office early. Can you elaborate, please? Well, I, I, I'm of the opinion that, I mean, all these people, and this is all just opinion, this is all speculation. I'm of the opinion that Mueller and that crowd who are handling this investigation uh, I guess right now, uh, starting to sleep with one eye open because of this congressman uh, from Florida who said that he wants him uh, um, uh, to, to get him fired because what was it he said? He's, uh, the guy from Florida said that it's, uh, I, f I forget his uh, raison for that, but the, the, uh, I feel like Mueller and that crowd, they really are professionals who know what they're doing. And they understand that the, to extract the president from office is an excruciating process for this country, regardless of party. It's something that we do not enjoy doing. We do not want to impeach the president, even if the president is an eighth degree black belt buffoon like the one we have now. <laughs> they do not want to yank him out of office. And the, um, uh, so they're probably gonna lay off and things are getting a little quieter for the holidays. <laughs> they don't want to have us have you know, uh, the, the holidays s spoiled by that. Then after the first of the year, I think they're going to really, really start to hit the pedal to the metal here. And everything I'm hearing from friends of mine, because we all have some connections in that world, is that this money laundering thing is the, tr is the trail. Whether it connects to Russia or not is a different story. The, tr the Trump is a man who has a, this is the main reason why you don't see his income taxes. And there's a lot of stuff going on there. And I do believe that the, the, the Republicans, now they may want to wait till 2018, November, to see if there's a continuation of what we had the other day, in which there's this kind of you know, renunciation uh, voting. 
but at the same time, the longer they wait, they gotta kinda get the cordite out of the room, the stink of the gunshot out of the room once they kill him, so that they can mount Pence as their leader, because Pence will be the president. And, no, but I mean, but at least Pence, listen, anything is better than what we have, and Pence, is, is a, his policies are abhorrent, but he's one of them, so there's more of a likelihood he'll deal with, with what's going on. It'll be infinitely better. He also, <coughs> he also would not be reelected. I, I can say right. with some certainty. Right, right, right. Or so some friend of mine said, what they want to do is they want to get Pence in office right at the crack of 2019. So like when Johnson became president under, under Kennedy, he would have a shot at 10 years in office per the Constitution. He'd get less than half of uh, Trump's first term and two full terms of his own. So they'd have 10 years of this guy, which, which is wishful thinking. I think that, uh, I think that uh, they've got to decide for themselves I think it's just a matter of time deciding when to get rid of him and how so that the party can move on, because the party will never move on with him as president. Yeah, and you said there's nothing worse than we have now, but hear from the audience, and I have to say I get this call on the show much more than I get if Trump committed something really bad for the good of the country, uh, if it's a high crime or misdemeanor, he should really be impeached, I get this. As bad as Trump is, and as much as we'd like to see him impeached, wouldn't a Mike Pence presidency be worse? So, but are, are what, 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 wait, 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 let's do it with the audience. How many of you think, um, how many would, of you, if there's an impeachable offense, would be rooting for Donald Trump to be impeached? <laughs> and, and, how many of you would be rooting for not because Pence would be worse? <laughs> Impeachment wins. Yeah, as I believe it should because, um, you know, with Mike Pence, as odious as he is in so many ways, uh, he, 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 I, I would not worry about the, the, the real power and the real unchecked power that any president has, which is waging war. And, 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 and that's, we now have a mentally unstable, whatever you want to diagnose him as, a mentally unstable person who, is in, who has the nuclear codes. I, I don't care what you say about Mike Pence. I, I'll go for Mike Pence over that. And as I say, I can imagine Donald Trump, because his 35% love him, in some managing somehow to get reelected. I, I, I don't think I can imagine uh, Mike Pence. I just have one question for the audience. Do you think Trump is mentally unstable? Oh, this gentleman here, you. Do, do you think he's mentally unstable? You do? Okay, no, this gentleman in the front row, you. You do, okay. I couldn't tell because we've been working hard up here. <laughs> we've been working so hard up here. And the entire evening, you've been like this. <laughs> and and this, it's the front row effect. It really does, it really is, you know, uh, a buzzkill for Kurt and I. <laughs> okay. But I want to ask the two of you, I want to ask the two of you, because uh, uh, you're, you know, political animals. W do you really fear that uh, Trump will get us into a nuclear war? You view that as real? Uh, I guess I don't walk around thinking that he's actually going to do it, because I tend to think, as unstable as he is, that he thinks he's playing a game of unpredictability. And we've seen him temper it on the Asia trip. He's not talking in those terms. Oh, we did a little bit yesterday. Don't toy with us. So I tend to think not, but don't quote me. And, and short of nuclear, it doesn't have to be nuclear war. It can be an, an, an unwise war, a, a conventional invasion of North Korea that he could. Or Venezuela. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, California, you know. We're uh, going to buy. <laughs> uh, um, you heard the Bannon thing, right? Sorry. I was going to say, we're going to bomb the Pacific Palisades. <laughs> so bad, those people. Hollywood. Audience member asks, when did you realize, Alec, that you could morph into DJT? No, I, listen, I, I, don't, I don't view that as anything I do well. I, just, I, I know that the cold opening of SNL, which is the kind of foundation of all this stuff we've been doing, is, is, the, is the firing of a cannon of a 90-minute show that is live in front of a live audience. It's not, as I say to people, it's not like Steven Spielberg uh, uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis doing Lincoln, you know? <laughs> they were rendering this finely stitched, finely embroidered performance of, you know, the details of the man inside the man. We're doing this great, 
we're doing this crazy, you know, kind of, uh, you know, cartoon. It's a, it's a, it's a big bloated caricature. And I, I mean, I read on the internet sometimes all the time, you're like, you know, Alec Baldwin, go home, you suck, you suck, as Trump. And I sit there and I go, you know, maybe I do suck, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know? And then I take my Emmy and I, you know, uh, <laughs> and I iron my shirts with it. And, and I heat by, it up. by the way, I mean, the, 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 why his Trump is successful has, is, is, it's an interesting question because it's not just about your skill at that. But what people don't know, and, and, and he should just go on the road doing, is his, his hilarious mimicry of obscure actors from the 40s and <laughs> 50s, of Marlon Brando, of all kinds of people. I could just, it's, but, but, the, but the, th this is why I wanted to work with him, just to be able to, just to For me to bullshit this. with you all day long. But, but the so, truth of the matter is, that, that, that I'll finish about this with this, and that is, you want to know, what I think, what, what, what the best thing is about the Trump that I do, is that Trump himself hates it so much. That's what I think. <laughs> so I'll take that. I'll take that. What would Mr. Anderson want us to most remember about his book, Fantasyland? Somebody who's actually not trying to be cute. Um, that it is incumbent upon all of us who still consider ourselves members of the reality-based community not to give up and to make a stand for saying, I'm not going to accept the nonsense you're spouting just because, hey, it's your opinion, basically. Uh, and, and, and that, 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 that I, I don't think we can, you know, uh, it's a fairly dark picture I paint of what's happened to America in the last 50 years, um, or the last hundreds, but especially in the last 50. And, uh, but, but I, I, I really do, I, I, I don't think we can swing back to uh, the way it was, uh, in, 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 uh, but I do think we can stop uh, the, the, stop the, the fantasy land, uh, tied from, from going further, and, and, and Donald Trump and Trumpism, while it's a great expression of what I wrote about, even though I was writing the book before he ever came along as a president, um, it's, it's not just it. I mean, he'll, that will end one way or another. There will be no more President Trump, but all of these uh, problems that we've, we've, we've indulged uh, in, in terms of not holding people accountable for reality, uh, will we'll be there, and we, we have to fix those. I want to take just to interrupt this. I, I, this is what I do best. I'm so corny and sappy this way, and I want to say that, that we have a great opportunity to say that real pleasure for me to be on stage with these two is these are two men who host television shows on public radio shows rather on public radio that are among the best radio shows on public radio, the best. And I hope, I hope you, I mean, I, I always joke with him. I always, you know, lather him from head to toe whenever I see him. But I'll be in my house shaving if I'm not out the door early. And I'm there and his show's on and Brian says blah, blah, blah. Brian says blah, blah, blah. And I stop and I'm like, my God, did you hear that? <laughs> Screaming at my wife in the, other, in the bedroom. Like, my God, did you hear what Brian said? <laughs> God, these people, you know, like, you know. And, uh, his show is the most concise and the best, and the best uh, digest of what's going on in New York and beyond. And his show, yeah. Studio 360, you've got to listen to Studio 360. His show is a great, great, great radio show on public radio. It's great, yeah. the two of them, yeah. fantastic. But it, it sounds like you shouldn't listen when you're shaving. I know, I've got uh, gashes around my head. And, and with all due humility, uh, considering who the three of us are up here, you know who's going to lead us out of this fantasy land, Kurt? Who's that? Women. Oh, I do. No question. No, and, and I, I, you know, I mean, again, what happened on Tuesday night, we shouldn't just say, oh, good, done. No. Uh, but but, but uh, it, did, it did make me think again, because of women in no small part, um, that... Uh, <coughs> That what we, that the thing I thought during the the the, the uh, about the success of Trump's candidacy before he was elected, which was as so many people thought, this is the last gasp of this uh, sad uh, 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 sort of uh, pathetic uh, uh, patriarchal remnants. And okay, they they got their guy. He's not going to be president. Fine. I, 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 since, of course, my, my view changed once he was elected president, but I, I do think that the other night, 
gave me at least the glimmer of feeling that, that, we, that yes, this is just a long last hurrah uh, before uh, we take our rightful place as the, the subordinate subjects to the women running the world. Um, <laughs> But I think that, 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 you know, an interesting thing to me was that, uh, and I'll try to make this connection if I can, and that is that, uh, you know, the, the two, the three referendum issues that were on the ballot here in New York were, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the Constitution Convention that got shot down, the, uh, the um, um, uh, use of the forest land or whatever it is, uh, there's some, some swapping of public lands and so forth, and the right of judges to uh, seize the pensions, as you all know, of... Uh, of uh, officials who were convicted of crimes, which I thought was so happy to see that because, you know, in this country, and this is just my observation in my lifetime, the, the, the list of things goes from uh, uh, sexual assault, and we're going through that whole spasm now, uh, more people coming down today in the, in the paper and in the news, another sign of my age, in the paper. It was in the paper, everyone. <laughs> it was there in the paper. Uh, all you young people should read the paper more. Uh, but uh, uh, so the um, uh, but, but uh, the, the point being that in this country, uh, short of sexual scandal, which we have, seem to have a tremendous appetite for, the scandal beyond assault and rape as a separate put that in a separate category. People having affairs. Uh, there was that wonderful article that was in the in the Times a little while ago on the anniversary of the Gary Hart scandal. And they talked about that being the fulcrum, that being the turning point, where all of a sudden political reporting became about these kind of vague assessments of people's character to be candidates and not about their positions and not about you know, real reporting. This article, you can Google it, right? Gary Hart, anniversary at New York Times. The article is breathtaking, this article. And uh, the, uh, maybe it was, he's got a book coming, I don't know, or had it. But my point is, is that you know, with Trump, you know, we have Trump, who he's been accused of being a sexual predator. And I think that people are trying to, there are certain people who are trying to press that case. Uh, very difficult uh, when you're a person of power and privilege, uh, movie stars, political figures, and so forth. But one thing we can keep pressing forward is this notion that Americans, maybe in second position, have a great disdain for it. That is, people who steal from the public till or use their power in order to line their own pockets or the pockets of their friends. And that apparently seems to be the case with Trump, you know, where Mueller is headed. Trump and his family are front men, potentially, we'll see what the charges are, to enrich other people at the, at the ex expense of the public. And that is something that I think Americans have a real, real uh, 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 disregard for. But don't we think, speaking of women, speaking of Donald Trump, speaking of his uh, life as a sexual harasser uh, and assaulter, that, that absent his election... Alleged. Uh, uh, accused, uh, accused by himself, by only only by seven him, himself and seventeen women. But yes, yeah. um, uh, but but absent his election, which was among other things a just a repudiation of of oh we don't that that's okay we don't care about that. Um, I'm not sure that the 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 tsunami that began with Harvey Weinstein would have happened to the extent it did. That it's a kind of displaced. Oh, you get to be president? Well, these guys don't get to do this. That's right. You know, so. But it's a weird thing that they so say. So silver lining is what I'm saying to the well, whole well, Trump presidency. You know. Go, go ahead, I'm sorry. I go guess ahead. now that we found a silver lining, we have to wrap up. Wait a minute. Um, you're going on a book tour. This is the beginning of a tour with the two of you, is that right? We're going on a tour together. Yes, we are. I'm psyched. We are. We're going across America to begin his campaign for the presidency in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a name of a party? Of the party I would like to, uh, what That's party? That's correct. Of a party I'd like to run with? That's right. run with? You could make up your own. Uh, well, I mean, th that would be. The uh, dream big party. The dream big party. The, the fantastic party. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the steak tartare party. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, I think, um, I think I, what I, if I was serious about politics, what I'd probably try to do is revive the Democratic Party. Mm. They need reviving, but I think that they're... Ladies and they're gentlemen, please thank Kurt Anderson and Alec Baldwin. Thank you.